Hello, hello, hello. Oh, wait, this thing's already recorded. Well, let's do it to it. Hello, and welcome back to A Squirrel Plays. Today, we're going to be having a look at a TTRPG called Tri-Cube Tales, and I'm pretty excited. Now, I wasn't going to do this video until later because I wanted a bit more time to get things just right and make sure I did it proper justice, but... The holidays are coming up, and it'll be Christmas time soon, and that means families will be coming together, hopefully, and spending some time with each other. And if your family is into TTRPGs and you're wanting something to play, well, this might be something for you to pick up and try for two reasons. One, it's super easy to pick up and learn. We were able to jump in on our first game and get most things right. And two, it's free. Or at least the PDF is over on DriveThruRPG, but I'll get to that in a minute. But that's why we're doing this now instead of later. I wanted to get the word out in time for Christmas because it might be something y'all can try out over the holidays, so here's hoping. And with that said, let's get into this thing. The game is made by Richard Woolcock, and at the risk of being on H-Bomber Guy's next video about plagiarism, I'm just going to read Richard's intro to the game from his own book. <laughs> Tri-Cube Tales started as a simple set of guidelines for role-playing with my five-year-old son. I wanted a system where the GM could handle all the complexity, so the player could roll 1 to 3d6 and then interpret the results without needing to apply any arithmetic. The use of tokens also provided my son with a visual and tactile reminder that worked better than using a pen and paper. However, I found the rules appealed to adults as well, so I decided to expand and flesh out the system. When DriveThruRPG promoted the phone PDF format recently, I thought it was a good fit for Tricube Tables. I thought it was a good fit for Tricube Tales. It's a portable RPG you can play anywhere, so where better to keep the rule book than on your smartphone? But I also decided to offer a print-on-demand version, as some people dislike reading books on their phone or having electronic devices at the table. And since this game was originally meant for a five-year-old, I was pretty confident that I could take it and run a game just fine with it. As it turns out, I was wrong. Apparently a five-year-old child is smarter than I am, so that really gave me a fine confidence boost. Man, I don't really want to talk about it anymore, man. You stupid game. All right, but more seriously, one thing that might have stood out to you is this part right here about a phone PDF. That was actually the first time I had heard of such a thing, and yeah, this is it. This is an actual page from the phone PDF. This is what it looks like, and I think that's pretty cool. It makes it very easy to scroll through and read on your phone. Who knew? And I know a lot of the folks watching these videos prefer a physical book, but I would still like to point out one thing I really appreciated in this PDF. The chapters and bookmarks are very well laid out already in the PDF. It makes it look like it's a lot bigger than it really is, but having these makes it easy to jump around and navigate quickly. I've seen a couple of TTRPG books that either have very few bookmarks in them or none at all. So this was a nice little hidden gem. But that's the PDF, Mr. Squirrel Man. Tell me about the game. Well, all right, all right. You act like I'm actually competent at this kind of thing. But since we're still on that surface level, let me make a couple comments on the artwork. The cover was done by Luigi Castellani. And look, Luigi, my man, there's one thing I want to point out to you here. Your tank has a face on it. I'm serious, look. There's the eyes, and then these are like teeth or something down here. Now, am I crazy? You guys see it? It's a face, man, I'm telling you. That said, though, I like it. You got your alien, a modern-day tank with a face on it, a futuristic mech over here, and then a guy with a shield and an axe. Right away, it lets you know the game covers a lot of settings. The rest of the art within the book is done by Rick Hershey and Storm Cook. And while it's not super detailed, ultra-realistic stuff, I like it. I think it does the job well for what it is. And we'll be seeing some more of that as we go through this, but some of the better ones you wouldn't see normally in the video unless I showed it to you now, so here you go. Now look at that, isn't that cool? And this. All right, now we can get into the game. In Richard's own words, Tricube Tables... I keep calling it Tricube Tables. Tricube Tales is a minimalist... Tricube Tables... Tricube Tales is a minimalist, narrative-driven tabletop role-playing system. It is designed to handle a variety of different genres and settings and doesn't require much setup or bookkeeping. This book assumes that the reader is already familiar with tabletop RPGs, but the rules are reasonably straightforward and should be easy to explain, even to beginners or younger players. So in other words, it's right up my alley. Now let's have a look at how things work up in here. First things first, and it's bad news for the dice goblins, you only need 3d6. I know, man, it's terrible. Each player gets 3d6, and they also get 3 resolve, which is your HP, and the 3 karma. 
Not to be confused with the Karma system in EZD6, while it is similar, it's a bit stricter, and I like it. Now all that seems simple enough, right? So what else is involved in creating a character? What do you get? What do you do? Well, it's really pretty simple. To make a character, all you got to do is name it, of course, and then pick an archetype, a perk, and a quirk. And I tell you what, we'll use myself as a character to show you just how easy this is. So you take me, the squirrel, my name is Scrat, and the first thing we need to do is pick an archetype. And for that, you can choose from the traits Agile, Brawny, or Crafty. You take your trait of choice and combine it with a concept. And we'll look at some other characters when we're done here, but for now, let's pick Agile Sneaky Squirrel for our little friend here. And while we're at it, I'll go ahead and tell you how the three traits in your archetype work. Per the book, Agile characters roll 3d6 for anything related to quickness, dexterity, reflexes, or stealth, as well as ranged combat. Brawny characters roll 3d6 for any challenges based on strength, toughness, stamina, or athletics, as well as melee combat. Crafty characters roll 3d6 when they perform challenges related to charisma, intellect, willpower, or perception, as well as mental combat. Now, if you're doing something that isn't part of your archetype, then you roll 2d6. And if you're doing something that's way, way out of your archetype, like maybe an old crafty wizard attempting to move a rather large object with just his physical body, then you roll only 1d6. So essentially, if you're good at it, 3d6. If you can handle it, 2d6, and if it's a struggle, then 1d6. But what are you rolling against, you might wonder? Whatever the task, whether it's moving that large object mentioned earlier, maneuvering a starfighter through oncoming asteroids, or striking an opponent with your weapon, the GM will set the difficulty from 4 to 6. The book says most enemies should be difficulty 5, and I tend to agree. That's what most of the challenges were when we gave this a whirl, and it worked out pretty well. Also, I should point out that the GM does no rolling. All of the rolls, even when the enemy attacks, are done by the players, so no secret rolls by the GM. And then the next step is pick a perk. And if you're wondering what some of those perks are, you can choose from... Hoo -hoo, buddy, have I got news for you. There is no list of perks. You decide what your perk is. The sky is the limit, and just to give you an idea, here's some perks that the book lists as examples. Charming, a magical sword, necromancy, noble bloodline, psionicis, sans Dionysus. Damn it, Richard, you're making me look like an idiot. Quick reflexes and scholar of the occult. So as you can see, your perk can be whatever the heck you want it to be. Lord of the hamsters could be just that, a lord of hamsters. So we'll put nibbler for our perk because squirrels can nibble on just about anything and cause all kinds of problems. And for quirks, it's the same concept. Pick whatever you want, but a quirk is something that hinders you. It makes accomplishing a task more difficult. And for our quirk, I'm going to use easily distracted for what is probably obvious reasons, especially if you watched my last video. Give yourself three HP, or resolve as it's called in this game, and three karma, and bada boom, bada bing, you're done with the thing. Seriously though, that's all it takes, you're done, and if you don't believe me, just have a look at these character examples from the book. An agile cyborg gunslinger with the perk cybernetic arms and the quirk arrogant, a brown, a brownie, I'm hungry, a brawny draconian knight with a draconic heritage perk and a ruthless quirk. A crafty psychologist with a psychic powers perk, which sounds pretty nice to be honest, and the quirk of being stubborn. All right, confession time. I know I just joked about being easily distracted like two seconds ago, but when I was writing this script, I got to looking at this picture and I thought, man, that uniform looks really, really familiar. I thought it was one of the uniforms from Stargate, like when they're on the Daedalus or something. So naturally, I stopped everything I was doing and went to Google because I thought it would have been really neat to see the inspiration for the artwork. But I unfortunately could not find anything, but I swear I have seen something really, really close to this somewhere, and I want to know what it is. Anyway, let's talk about the karma system. <laughs> Greetings, fellow Easy D6 players. Easy, Scotty, easy. You've had your turn, and your video is like 90% of the views of my entire channel. All right, so karma, how does that work? The idea is to use it to make your life easier. A simple way to use it is to reduce the difficulty of the roll by one. There are some other things you can do with it, but I'm not going to get into all of it because I don't want the video to be too long, and plus, the rules are free anyway, so nothing is stopping you from going and getting the full story. 
What I did want to point out, though, is something that I think is really neat, and that's the way you get karma points back. Before you roll, a player can say that they want to use their quirk to make the roll harder. This will increase the difficulty of the roll by one. Players regain... Players regain one karma point for using their quirk, and if they succeed the challenge roll, they can choose to recover one point of resolve instead if they want. Pretty cool, I thought. And yes, you can level up and progress your character in this game. This allows you to gain new perks, quirks, more karma, and resolve. You can also convert an existing affliction into a quirk, and if you're wondering what the heck that means or why you do that, well, Richard had to explain that himself in a comment because I didn't know either, thanks to my inability to understand basic text. A quirk is under the player's control. They determine when they want to use it. The GM cannot force it upon them. An affliction, however, is the opposite. The GM gets to use it against the player whenever he wants and you get afflictions by reaching zero resolve. And again, I'm just kind of breezing over the top of these things. They are a little more in depth, and the book has some rules as well as tips and advice for running your adventures, but I can promise you it's all very, very simple stuff. Me and a couple of friends tried it just by glossing over the rules about 10 minutes before we started, and we went for it. Actually, I think one of them didn't even read the rules at all now that I think about it. Don't blame me, I have not read anything. Why? You had all day. To read. I was hanging out with my family. My brother came down from the city. You just told yeah, me you were I playing was... Mario Kart. <laughs> yeah, with my brother who came down from the city. But either way, we did mostly all right. We had a fellow by the name of Brent in the chat helping us out when we got a little confused, and that was really cool. I know I gave him a little bit of grief here and there, but I really enjoyed having him around. Our adventure started out in space. The players got to zip around in their starfighters and shoot down some space pirates, and they boarded a much, much larger ship. There was blasting, shooting, explosions, locked doors that shocked you if you failed the lockpick, all the good stuff. The whole reason they were after these space pirates is because the captain had the last known Hershey's Cookies and Cream candy bar in the entire universe, and Steph really wanted it. That's it. That was our plot. Not bad for a published author, eh? <laughs> so they tore their way through the ship, shot up all the baddies, but found out the captain had used an escape pod and got away. Not finding the candy bar, they then set the ship on a collision course to the nearest planet and then took an escape pod themselves, completely forgetting their ships that were still attached to the one that they boarded and launched themselves down towards the same planet. Once on said planet, they tracked the captain's escape pod and followed his tracks to a pyramid, because why not? Once there, they found some mummies and a giant spider, and funnily enough, after defeating the spider, I think they got stuck in the webs for a few hours before they could actually get to their candy bar. I'm telling you, they weren't the best at their job. But most importantly, it was a great time, and we tore through technically three maps. If you can call the space fight a map, but either way, it only took a couple of hours. And before we close it out here, there's just a couple other things I want to mention real quick. I'm pretty sure I've said this already, but just in case I haven't, yes, the PDF is free. If you go to Drive Through RPG, you'll see a list of options, and they all have price tags on them. However, you will notice in the description that it says you can download the full phone PDF for free by clicking the Publisher Preview button. But that's not the only thing free from Zadmar Games. No, 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 not by a long shot. Zadmar has you covered. There's an absolute truckload of one-page adventures. These all have the basic rules of the game on them, an objective and a setting, as well as some roll tables to generate your adventure. There's also plenty of examples on there to help you out, and this cool little thing at the bottom you can roll to add even more twists to your game. Like in the Stone Age setting, if you roll a 5 and a 4, you get the squirrel symbol. It's up to you how you want to interpret it, but I think we all know what it means. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. But anyway, there's a whole bunch of these, and yes, while they're kind of the same thing, these were not an insignificant amount of work. They all look really nice, got their own art and sets of symbols for your twists, and actually had a good amount of thought put into them, unlike some other things I have recently found on drive through TTRPG. Still deciding whether or not I should do a video on that or not. But hey, pretty wild to me that they're all free, and if you wanted to pay for them, they're less than a dollar. But wait, there's more! There's also a Tricube Tales solo rules you can grab. 
I've heard from more than a few people that they really, really, really like this rule set for solo play, and I'll admit, I've only glanced at it because I didn't find it until I started writing this script. But if it's anything like his other work, then yeah, I'm pretty sure it's great. I'll definitely be giving it a whirl in the near future, but unfortunately, I couldn't quite get to it in time before making this video. Though, with that said, it should probably have its own video, right? Anyway, there's still more. I'm telling you, it just keeps going. There's also adventures made by other people using the Tricube Tales rules, such as this one, which I can't pronounce, so I'll just call it Cthulhu's Second Cousin Twice Removed. It's about lifeguards protecting the beach from monsters trying to take over, so, you know, fantastic concept there. I am sold. There's lots of other adventures out there from other creators, and these are just a few of them right here. I think it's pretty neat to see all those adventures made by other people, and if I were Richard, I'd be feeling pretty good about it. I think it'd be neat to see in people enjoying your work and making things out of it for other people to share. Maybe. Maybe I'd get a little salty about it for people making money off my hard work. I don't know. But speaking of money, let's talk about that real quick and then we'll wrap this whole thing up. I think I mentioned this a bit in my mouse herder video since it was pay what you want, but I'll bring it up again. I've mentioned more than once at this point that a lot of this content is free. Richard over at Zadmar Games makes it pretty clear you can grab this stuff for free just by clicking the preview and getting the whole thing. If you want to be supportive, you can. Now, I'm all for grabbing a TTRPG for free and trying it out, but, but, if you and your friends had a good time with it, I do strongly encourage you to go back and throw some money at the creator, especially if you play it more than once. Making these things takes a lot of work, and Richard goes the extra mile just on the technical side, too. Ignoring all the work it took to get the rules right, he makes a nice, legible PDF, and he goes through the trouble of bookmarking chapters like I mentioned earlier. But on top of that, the guy even uses layers in his PDFs to make your printing life a lot easier. Despite his ugly mug, this Zadmar Games guy is actually pretty nice. And since you made it this far into the video, I'm going to let you in on a little behind-the-scenes secret. I'll just read word for word what Richard said himself. I'm also working on a supplement called Tricube Tactics, which adds an optional layer of complexity for combat and character advancement, but that's still under work. He also said to like and subscribe. Hey, oh, you thought I forgot. And with that, it is shout-out time, and that shout-out goes to... That's right, it goes to Richard of Zadmar Games. Since he's part of the Squirrel community and in the Discord grip, grip, and in the Discord group, that means I can do that. He's one of us now, and see, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, the cool kids hang out in the Squirrel Discord. But also, big shout-out to Brent I mentioned earlier. He was a pretty cool guy who came out of nowhere during our stream. Since he was familiar with Tricube Tales, he was able to help us along when we got a little confused. And he stayed with us for the whole thing, I think. It was pretty great, so kudos to him for that. When he first showed up to the stream, the first thing he asked was what difficulty I set the enemies at, and my first thought was, oh god, please do not let this be the creator of this game here to judge me. Dude, seriously, I was so nervous. Can you imagine trying a game out on stream for the very first time and then the creator shows up right at the beginning? Oof. But we made it, lads. We did it. And that's the end of the video. If you've played Tricube Tables before... Table... I see... I, mm. If you've played Tricube Tales before, be sure to let me know in the comments some of your finer moments, any tweaks or changes that you might have made, and some of your general thoughts. Does it look like something you might enjoy, or is it entirely too simple? If you've played something similar, be sure to share that too, because I'm up for testing out more systems.